Really delighted to welcome Gurbir Graywall, the director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement since 2021, who has been kind enough to make the trip out to California to be with us here today. Uh, thank you so much. Um, pre previously, Gurbir was the Attorney General for the State of New Jersey, Thanks. and also the Bergen County Prosecutor, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for New Jersey's most populous county. He's served in the past as an AUSA for the District of New Jersey, where he was a chief of the Economic Crimes Unit, and also as an AUSA for the Eastern District of New York, where he was in the Business and Securities Fraud Unit. Gerbier, thank you again for joining us here in San Francisco. It's a real honor. My pleasure, Bruce. Thanks for having me. And I'm delighted to have as our moderator today Kristen Snyder, who you all probably know, a litigation partner now at Deb Boys and Plimpton in San Francisco. Kristen's well known at this event. She previously joined us many times during her 18 years at the SEC, where she was the Deputy Director of the Division of Examinations, uh, resident in San Francisco, also served for eight years in the Division of Enforcement. Welcome, Kristen, and thank you for moderating today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Bruce. It's yeah, great to be here. turn it over to you. Great. Well, it's nice to see you. Nice uh, to see you, too. Yeah, and it's nice to see you on this coast. Um, well, I, we have so much to cover, I think, in a very little uh, amount of time to do it. So I think I'll jump right in with you. And uh, when uh, we talked about this, I think, before coming on stage today, but you made quite a stir, I think, here last year with your speech um, directed at Defense Council and cooperating with the, the commission in investigations. And I just wanted to know, how's it going? So uh, has it gotten better? <laughs> uh, well, you know, first, thanks to Bruce for having me back after that speech. Uh, <laughs> and second, thanks for all of you uh, for coming out after that speech. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have some thoughts to share on that speech. But before I do, I have to give the disclaimer that my views this afternoon or in my official capacity as director of the Division of Enforcement, don't reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, uh, or the staff. Uh, listen, you know, I think what got lost in that speech is, is that we all have to do better, and that includes the lawyers on our side of the V as well, because this shouldn't be a game of gotcha when we, when we talk about enforcement. Uh, we shouldn't be hiding the ball. We should be straightforward. We should be engaged in robust discussions throughout the investigative process. We should be having reverse proffers where possible, you know, to move investigations along. And, and you know, that sort of got lost in, in the speech last year. Uh, certainly when there's dilatory tactics employed by defense counsel that obstructs the truth-seeking mission uh, of, of the commission, it, it delays investigations, it's bad for those individuals who are under investigation, uh, and, and it doesn't really help anyone in the process. So I, I think things have gotten better, uh, you know, and I just didn't want to lose sight of the fact that we all have a, a part to play in this, and, and that message uh, should be heard loud and clear by the staff because, you know, we want to get to the right answer as quickly as possible because that benefits everybody. It benefits the market, it benefits your clients, uh, and, and it really helps us, um, you know, move things along. Good. I'm glad it is going better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, I have fodder for a, a lawyer's behaving part three, badly part three, but I'll save that. <laughs> well, we'll switch gears for just a second. and. Don't worry, we will talk about e-coms, we will talk about crypto, because we've, we've uh, heard a lot in the press lately. But I wanted to just get your sense, you know, what else is going on? What are some of your other priorities? And we've seen things that are styled maybe as sweeps, um, mm -hmm. so I'd be interested to know, too, if those are expected to continue. Yeah, I mean, great question. Um, you know, I've been at this for almost two years uh, now, and when you look at uh, speeches I, I gave early on, uh, I made it a point to say that a, a key priority for us is uh, protecting uh, public trust, rebuilding public trust in the markets. Uh, I talked about uh, why public trust has diminished in those prior speeches, uh, whether it's you know the, the misdeeds of, of big financial firms or the failure to regulator failure of regulators to hold them accountable when that happens. And, and I laid out my priorities to, to rebuild that trust, and, and that was to focus on robust enforcement, uh, to focus on robust penalties uh, in, in our recommendations, in our enforcement actions, and work with each of you to create a culture of proactive compliance. I think that was certainly true two years ago. I think it's particularly true today. As we look around at what's happening, uh, we have seen events in the crypto markets where investor confidence uh, has been lost, where 
Uh, folks are looking at regulators to hold bad actors accountable. Uh, we have seen that contagion spill over into the banking sector where we've seen failures in the banking sector and we have investors and, and, and uh, everyday Americans who are being hurt and looking at regulators to, to help them. Uh, and then we have bank failures for other reasons as well and folks looking at us uh, for accountability. So I think uh, I think the priorities remain the same, uh, to focus on that robust enforcement, which means simply moving our matters with a sense of urgency. Because if, if the public reads about a news story today and doesn't see accountability for two years, that trust dissipates. And, and that's a problem, because when that trust doesn't exist, the markets don't function as well as they could. And so we've delivered on that. The staff has done incredible work over the last fiscal year, bringing more enforcement actions than in the prior fiscal year. When we talk about robust penalties, that means that we need to have penalties in our cases that really have a deterrent effect, that aren't simply just priced in as the cost of doing business, that we are seeking all the remedies we can in our toolkit to make sure that we're protecting investors and holding bad actors accountable. And we've done that. In the last fiscal year, we delivered on that. The commission ordered uh, remedies in excess of $6.4 billion, 4.3 of which were in the form of penalties. That's a record in the commission's history. Uh, and it really, I think, was, you know, equals, I guess, uh, the penalties ordered in the prior three years altogether. That's not to say we're going to do that every fiscal year or beat that record every fiscal year, but that was important to us for accountability. And we'll continue to, to make sure that we are seeking appropriate remedies in our cases to make sure we're deterring uh, misconduct and promoting uh, better behaviors uh, in, in the markets. And that last piece, that proactive compliance piece, remains important for us because we realize that we can't do it alone, that we need to have the help of the, the gatekeepers, the compliance professionals, all those people who are on the front lines because we can't be everywhere. And so one of the things that you've seen in recent commission orders, I hope, is more of a roadmap on how to get to compliance. You've seen more of, of a roadmap as to what good cooperation looks like because I know quite often uh, defense attorneys, in-house counsel, are asked, what's the benefit of going in? And so that's hopefully been laid out in recent commission orders uh, and is something that you all find useful because, again, we can't do it alone. And then as far as substantive priority areas, in addition to that sort of those thematic areas, we want to be where the risks are. And the risks are really where the investor interest is right now. Uh, the crypto markets certainly are a priority for us to make sure that we're holding uh, those who are engaged in unregistered offerings accountable, that we're holding intermediaries who aren't properly registered accountable because investor protection demands that. Uh, it's, you know, I, I think about the Warren Buffett line that it's when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. The tide's been going out for some time, and we see uh, a lot of concern in the private fund space, a $21 trillion space where uh, there's a lot of opacity and a lot of conflicts of interest, fee and expense issues uh, that concern us. So that'll be a substantive priority area for us. And then going back to trust, when gatekeepers fall down on the job, that, that diminishes trust. So that's going to remain a priority for the commission to make sure that we're holding gatekeepers accountable in the right cases, in the right cases. And, and I think last, a substantive priority area for us would be looking at insiders who abuse their positions, who take advantage of information asymmetries to profit themselves. And, and again, that diminishes trust. So we brought actions where, where insiders have abused 10b51 plans. I think you could continue to see us active in that space uh, to find uh, bad actors there and bring accountability uh, to insiders who are abusing their positions. I just wanted to pick up on a thread that you I didn't answer the sweeps question. But oh, I'll, the sweeps. We'll, we'll no, get, no, we'll no, no, yeah. no, please yeah. do. Yeah, please do. I'm no, going to stop. I mean, yeah. Like, listen, yeah. Uh, somebody asked me this the other day. Are you going to have more sweeps? You bet. I, I think sweeps, if done correctly, right, if we see risk in, in an area, like the off-channel communications is a perfect example, where you saw a, a, a pattern of behavior, and, and it really came about this way. We were investigating a particular matter, and we saw on one side of that investigation an entity produce no records in response to, to a subpoena, and on the other side, an entity produced the other side of those communications. And the difference was, at the broker-dealer, the communications were being done on WhatsApp or off-channel or text, and on the other side, the people they were communicating with were keeping those records. And so that flagged for us a risk area, that you had broker-dealers and you had people high up 
uh, in these entities who were using off-channel communications to engage in firm business and flouting uh, their record keeping requirements. And this was not a pandemic issue. It wasn't prompted by the pandemic because it was pre-pandemic. And so we thought it can't be the case that this issue exists only here, so we cast a wide net. And when we cast that wide net, we saw that this behavior was really just everywhere, at, at the largest shops uh, on the street. And so the sweep there, announcing those 15 or 16 matters together, over a billion dollars in penalties, undertakings, uh, a whole host of compliance measures, sent a more powerful message than doing cases serially, individually. And that was the goal of that particular sweep. And I think when done correctly, it could be effective in promoting better behavior. So we saw recently the, the cases against Scotiabank and HSBC, and there was recognition, I think, in those orders that mm -hmm. there were self-reports that were done, and there was a lower penalty amount, with the at least with the SEC, CFTC, Maybe right. not so much, um, but with the how much does self-reporting go into the penalty determination? And I know it's probably facts and circumstances, but is there also recognition if a party is coming to you before any government agency has gotten involved? It's, that's a great question. Listen, you know, there's no secret that the behaviors that result in cooperation credit uh, are laid out in, in the Seaboard report, which is probably old enough to drink now. It's like 20 years old or 21 years old. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's self-reporting, it's self-policing, it's the remediation, it's the cooperation. So self-reporting is huge. And this is the other side of sweeps, right? When we announced those 16 or so matters, we put out an email address, to, you know, for people to provide information, for, what, for folks to come in and self-report and let us know if you have this issue to get ahead of it. Because again, we knew that those 16 or so firms, those broker-dealers, weren't the only ones who had this problem. Others probably did. And it was in their interest to come forward. And so I think you saw the benefit of that sweep with that, that messaging out there, the, the big penalties, the $125 million per each of those broker dealers based on size. And then when you looked at HSBC, which was, you know, similarly situated uh, to those prior, you know, respondents, and their penalty was 15 million. They came in, they self-reported after that initial sweep. They, they corrected the, the problem on their end. They put in place uh, the right sort of systems to make sure they were retaining their business communications, and they did the right thing. The same thing with Scotiabank. They did the right thing, and it was 7.5 million in that case. So I think you know that that's an important component uh, of self-reporting. That if you come in, there's a benefit. We want to message it out because again, we can't do it alone. And so the you know the other part of that. Uh, question you were asking me about what? So if there's another government agency that's already involved, oh, for instance, yeah. you know, does that does that discount your self-report if if you're already being investigated by I, another entity? I, I don't think so because any sort of report is better than no report at all. Um, because you know we've had plenty of matters where whether we're investigating uh, a certain type of misconduct and we stumble into something else and and the firm had some notice of it and they didn't self-report it. But then they engaged in, in all the right behaviors. They started to remediate. They started to cooperate. They started to, you know, provide us information about what had happened. Uh, we've had a number of orders along those lines where we've recognized that cooperation. Uh, there was a revenue recognition case last year, Surgeline, which, which spoke to those types of uh, facts and circumstances. So I would say, you know, any report is better than no report at all. And then if it's the case that we discovered it on our own, that might be an, a negative factor for us in assessing you know, what had taken place there. And I feel like I have to ask this question. Sure. I don't know if you're able to answer it. I know that we know that there are a number of investigations that are, you don't have to comment on that, that are going on in the, the electronic communication space. But the big question is, will this continue? Um, and I, you know, I don't know if that's something that you can answer, but um, any clarity would be helpful. I mean, the, the, the investigations, um, I mean, we've announced it publicly. There's been some reporting that there's investigations because IAs have record keeping requirements, albeit not directly similar to the broker dealer uh, record retention requirements. So I can't imagine that the problem was limited to, to broker dealers. So, you know, if you're representing an IA who has this issue, I think. It behooves you to, again, self-report, correct it, come in, work with us to address it. So um, again, I think the, the problem uh, is pervasive. 
uh, and, and so if you haven't taken notice of, of the enforcement actions we've brought to date, uh, it's about time that you did, and you're still better off coming to us before we come to you. All right. Um, and then just switching gears, just you were talking about some of the penalties and holding mm -hmm. um, firms accountable. As defense lawyers, often, I think as we're talking with the commission, especially if we're moving toward resolution, we're often looking at historical precedent, you know, maybe to come up with the right charge proposal or the right amount of penalty. How important and how persuasive is the is historical precedent to you? And, um, you know, how do you think about yeah. that? So, so let me tell you what doesn't work. Uh, and then I'll tell you what, what is super helpful. And, and this is a real example. Uh, it happened in multiple cases, but looking at the books and record cases in, in particular. Uh, we had a, a firm come in and, and an associate probably spent, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 plus hours staying up late at night scouring the SEC website looking for prior precedent. Uh, for books and records violations. Uh, the firm put together a well submission, which was well in excess of our 40-page limit, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages of appendices, including you know, tables collecting all these prior uh, precedents about, you know, for these types of violations, look, 20 years of precedent. Uh, the highest penalty historically has been around 15 million. It can't possibly be higher than that. And, and so in, in that Wells meeting, which we did take, uh, and we do take a lot of Wells meetings, I looked at that and I said, like, maybe I'm new here, but when you're showing me a table and you're putting together uh, 20 years of precedent and all the penalties have been around the same range, and yet here we are and the behavior continues, that shows me that those penalties are not having the deterrent effects that they should, the specific effects for those particular firms and then more broadly across the space. And so, I would flip that to you and say we need to have higher penalties because those weren't working. So that's an example of where it, precedent really doesn't help you if you collect it and bring it to us. Uh, and it might backfire on you as it did in that particular case because that helped us really, you know, say we need to make sure we're not, that firms aren't simply pricing this in as a cost of doing business, that we're really looking at penalties uh, that are having the deterrent effects specifically and generally that they should. Where it does work is if we're in an area where it's a novel interpretation of a rule, or maybe we're, you know, we're sort of on the edges, and, and you come in and you say, listen, you never brought an enforcement action on these types of facts for a violation of this type, for this particular uh, rule or regulation. I think that's helpful. Th that's helpful to get that context. Maybe there isn't, you know, sufficient clarity out there. Maybe this would be really pushing the envelope here a little bit, and maybe we need to take a step back and assess whether we're in the right place. I think that type of precedent, uh, that type of conversation is a helpful one. And so that kind of leads to a follow-up maybe with Wells meetings. When you are taking a meeting and when you are getting involved, you know, what should, because you're not going to get involved in every case. And so what are the types of cases that you think it is important as director to be involved in? Where does it make sense for a defense counsel to push for a meeting with you or with Sanjay? Yeah, I, listen, I, I think going back to your first question, uh, this should be a collaborative process. It, it should it should not be a, a game of gotcha. It, it shouldn't be that we're going to hold all of our cards close to the vest and surprise you at the 11th hour and hold something for trial. It, this is a truth-seeking mission that we're on. We want to figure out what happened, if there's a violation, if there's a recommendation to be made to the commission or not. And so, you know, well before the Wells process, there should be that back and forth. Uh, I think the most effective resolutions that I've seen are ones where an attorney has come in, uh, you know, well before a formal process and said, hey, you know, I, I know you're looking at this, but have you thought about, you know, these facts or have you looked at something this way? And we've had plenty of those cases where that gets elevated up to us and, and we'll have a conversation with the team and say, you know what, maybe we aren't looking at this in the right way. Maybe we're not sort of seeing things, you know, in the way that folks who are trying to make these decisions in real time are seeing them. And, and maybe this context, you know, counsels us to, you know, move on or, 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 or not move forward with an investigation. That's happened. Uh, that doesn't get publicized, but that sort of back and forth helps. Uh, I think, you know, with the Wells process, my concern, again, going to the public trust point as these investigations drag on for several years because we have, you know, all this process built in, um, in cases where 
there might not be a real factual dispute, where there might not be a novel legal issue, where there might not be something of programmatic concern, maybe in that case the, the Wells meeting happens at the associate level. Maybe it, it doesn't happen at the director or the deputy director level because those meetings take a, a tremendous amount of time for the staff to prepare for. So much goes into putting together the prep materials, sitting down with us, getting us up to speed, and then, you know, when we sit down, we, we do want to have a robust discussion. We just don't want to go through the motions and, and, and say thanks for the presentation and move on. So we want to invest the time in getting ready for those meetings. So we will take those meetings whenever the staff recommends them. If the staff says, we don't think there's an issue here, we'll look at the materials and generally defer to the staff. But there might be that case where we look at something and say, you know what, I think we want to sit down with folks here because this does have raised programmatic concerns. So those are the types of, uh, of matters uh, where we get involved in. And, and, and the other part of it is sometimes you'll get to the well stage uh, and, and a firm will say, let us put in a white paper first before you wells us. And then that builds in more time, right? right? And again, it might not raise the same sort of issues of, of programmatic concern or, or factual disputes might not be as, as clear in, in that particular case. And so we might say, no, you know, you're, you could have a white paper, but you know, then you'll have a short wells submission uh, or opportunity to put in a wells. And it might be, well, use your uh, white paper as your wells submission uh, just to sort of collapse the, the time period there. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. There is that inherent tension. You know, how much time do you kind of engage and negotiate before a, a formal wells process? Right. And so, are you seeing that change where the pre well, you know, the sort of pre wells discussion process is being shortened um, by the staff? Or I you, think so. Okay. I, yeah, I think we're seeing it. I mean, if we're looking at our, our the data points, um, we're seeing the, the the time from opening to to the recommendation stage of a matter uh, shrink. You know, I think it could we could do a little bit better there, but. Staff has been working incredibly hard and, in, you know, dealing with novel issues, uh, you know, dealing with really complex issues, dealing with all these issues in the context of a remote work environment. So despite all those challenges, they continue to, to bring cases more quickly and, and, um, resolve matters more quickly. Because again, the, the, the matters where we have a meeting and decide not to move forward, that happens. It just doesn't get publicized. So it's not always, the, the recommendation that results in an enforcement action, sometimes, you know, we'll get to the end of it and say, you know, we don't think there's a there there, or it could be after a Wells meeting where we walk away. I think that is a really helpful message. I don't know if there's any thinking about, um, I know that there were 21A reports, yeah. you know, and that's a, a long process too, but, and you're sitting here now and telling the audience, you know, defense lawyers these things, but I think that is helpful, you know, to hear that it matters. And yeah, I mean, it's hard to publicize unless the, 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 the party on the other side publicizes it, but there's been, you know, plenty of uh, Wells meetings that I've had uh, where at the end of it we've decided that maybe this is not a case where we want to make a recommendation to the commission to bring in enforcement action. Great, and I know we're running short on time, um, but... Uh, we have two minutes. We have two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we, we end with yes. with a speed with a round? speed yeah. a little bit of a speed round. Yeah. Um, you know, you've been um, in a number of different agencies and a number of different positions um, serving the public, and you know, you've now been at the SEC for eighteen months. Did I have my math right? Two coming. Yeah, in? It'll, it'll be two years in July. In July twenty six. But who's counting? <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess two questions. One. Um, you know, what is, what's been surprising or, you know, what's the thing that you love most about being at the SEC? And then we have a number of positions that I think are open or the SEC yeah. does both in LA and San Francisco. And this is an audience that, you know, you may draw from for your next enforcement So staff, we're hiring. So. <laughs> uh, we're hiring a lot. Yeah. Uh, we're hiring lawyers. We're hiring accountants. We're hiring all types of professionals. So uh, it's a remarkable agency, uh, remarkable staff. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I spent probably a dozen years as a federal prosecutor, and then I was a, a county prosecutor, and I was a state AG where I had the State Bureau of Securities, had criminal authorities, and you know, throughout the time, I worked with the SEC a lot you know, on parallel matters, particularly as an AUSA. And quite often, a lot of colleagues would leave the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and go to, to you know, a big firm, and you would go to their website, and they would say, securities litigation is one of their skill sets. Uh, you don't know this world till you work at the SEC. 
because that was one of the surprises to me when I walked in the door. Sure, I worked a lot of parallel investigations with the New York SEC, with the Philadelphia SEC, with the Home Office, but they were all in a really narrow space. There were your sort of insider trading matters, there were your fraud matters, there were your market manipulation matters. And so when I was leaving the AG's office, somebody asked me, what are you looking forward to the most? I said, you know what? You know, I'm looking forward to focusing on just one thing. Like I have 16 divisions as attorney general. There's like a huge portfolio. I'm just, I'd love to just go do one thing for a while. I walk in the door, this one thing, you know, people talk about we cover a, a vast waterfront. Not only is it a vast waterfront, it's a deep waterfront. And what I've noticed and, and what surprised me the most is the level of expertise that exists within the SEC to cover that waterfront. Not everybody knows everything about the entire waterfront, but there's enough expertise there that you could leverage. You could walk down the hall, you could call somebody, you could talk to one of the policy divisions who will take the time to, to educate you and work with you. Uh, and I think people don't realize that on the outside. When a recommendation goes to the commission, before it goes there, all the policy divisions have weighed in. You know, whether it's a court fin issue, whether it's an IM issue, whether it's DIRA on, on sort of the, you know, the, the investor harm. Like, there's so much collaboration that goes on before that work product is presented to the commission. So the level of expertise, the, the just the scope of the responsibility has surprised me, but uh, I'm incredibly impressed by the level of uh, expertise and, and the quality of the, the public servants that I get to work with each day. And so I encourage you, if you're looking to get into public service, if you're looking for a next career or to give back or to you know, just join an incredible organization to give the SEC a look and we're hiring across the country. So join us. All right, I think we'll end there because okay. that's a positive yeah. note. Yeah. Do you want to come back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Did, did Kristen just sign up again for the SEC? <laughs> uh, Gerbeer, thanks so much for your thoughts and your insights today and for joining us out here in California. And Kristen, very great moderating, and thanks for coordinating a great discussion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce.